Thank you. Uh, I decided to call my talk the Sustainable Consumer Zombie Theory. And I, I know it's not the most self-evident title, and it's an intriguing title. You don't probably usually expect to see the word zombie if you're appearing in an academic talk. But bear with me, and I think all of, all, of, all of this will make sense. So the story starts in 2018 when um, the IPCC report on climate change hit. And unlike many other IPC reports before, this was very much concerned on how do we transition into a more uh, climate-friendly um, society and how do we reduce carbon emissions. And in Finland, there was a huge public debate, about, unlike uh, others I have ever seen relating to these reports. And I noticed, personally, that a lot of the discussion started to concentrate on what should consumers do? How do consumers, through their consumption, can help build a you know, safer, more greener, carbon-free planet? And uh, like this quote over here, this is what, just one of many stating that consumers are central in the fight against climate change. And this is kind of like, reminds me of the, the so-called ethical consumer theory of market transformation, which goes something like this. That the theory goes that how we transform markets is that first we identify an ethical problem, we educate consumers about the problem, for example, about we tell them that there is a thing called climate change and you should be very scared about it. People adopt new values based on this education. They see the delight and they see, understand that they need to change. Consumers shop their values. They start to adjust their consumer behavior based on these newly adopted values. And as a result, markets become more ethical. So that's the theory, and it's very much, you know, you see it everywhere. You see it in different types of industry reports, different types of think tanks love the, the ethical consumer theory, and it's all over the news all the time. Like, here's how consumer values are changing. This is how consumers are becoming more green, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is it's false. It's, it's a completely false theory. It's what I call a zombie theory which means that it's a theory that has been proven false repeatedly, yet it refuses to die and keeps coming back. And you may be like, okay, he's a consumer researcher. How can he say some, such a thing? Because it sounds so intuitive. People you know, have values and they, they shop their values. It's not as simple. Let me first start by showing why it has been proven false. Let's start with this question of, do people consumer their values in the first place? And this was a question that was very popular in marketing and consumer research in the 1970s and 1980s. There was a whole host of studies that posited it that if we understand what are people's values, like what do they believe in? Do they believe in you know, progressiveness? Are they more conservative? Do they believe in you know, aesthetics, et cetera, et cetera? If we uncover their values, let's say through using questionnaires, then we can predict how they will be consuming. And these things are still very much in use in the industry. A lot of consulting industries or advertising agencies are still selling this kind of research. But the problem is that already in the 1990s, early 90s, these assumptions, this theory that people's values correlate directly with their consumption behavior was proven rather problematic. That it is at best an ambiguous relationship. People consume their values if it's convenient, if it's feasible. But very, very, very often, this relationship between values and actual consumer behavior, what people actually buy, what people actually consume, is fraught. And you see this especially in the realm of sustainable consumption. The idea that there is a so-called gap between attitude and behavior is almost the starting point of a lot of sustainable, uh, sustainable consumption research, to the point that we have papers say, stating that why ethical consumers don't walk their talk. And my own research has talked on this as well. And there's even a famous book called The Myth of the Ethical Consumer that goes at length into these problems of why are people not able to translate their, for example, preference or concern for the climate into actual purchasing behavior. So why does ethical consumption fail? Well, number one reason is purchase complexity. If you just think about you going to the supermarket, how many items do you buy a week? Let's say, let's put it at 100. Do you know the carbon footprint of each of those items? Can you name it like this? 
No, you don't. You might be aware of a couple of them because it might be on the, on the side, but this, just the sheer complexity of all the things that we're buying, all the sort of the effects of those buys are too complex for any one individual. You would literally need to have an app where you're sc scanning everything and it tells you in detail all the impacts of what you're doing, and it still wouldn't capture all the ways that you are impacting society or climate in a certain way. P purchasing and consumption is just too complex for the individual mind. The second reason is short-termism and habit inertia. Our values, we become, for example, the, the IPC report from 2008 it was a wonderful example because it created like a momentary jolt. The people were momentarily really like, oh, I want to do something for the climate. And then we become kind of like people who try to lose weight after New Year's. That we join a gym for the first couple of weeks, we are very sort of into it, we go to the gym, but then slowly we kind of go back to our old habits. The same thing happens in sustainable consumption. We are not able to sustain our commitment to you know, monitoring our purchases, for example, and more often than not, we start to revert back to our old practices that are unsustainable. An even more powerful example is the famous Animalia uh, scandal in Finland when there was a huge uh, uh, scandal of like how pork was being um, bred in Finland, and a lot of people stopped eating pork for a while, but they went right back for after two months or something like that. Third reason, free rider problems. Consumers are instinctively but also explicitly aware that if, not every, if everybody is not into sustainable consumption, then my own choices will not necessarily have an impact at, at all. So people kind of know that if not everybody is opting in, then why should I? And this is kind of like something that has also been shown in different kinds of experiments of the kind of tragedy of the commons. When there is a system where people are, for example, allowed to contribute to some sort of shared system, if people become aware that this is voluntary and people are not forced or disciplined into you know, keeping, uh, contributing to the shared commons, then many people will opt out to the point that maybe 5 to 10% of the population will continue doing the good thing even though others are not. And it is kind of about the same as the size of sustainable consumption markets. Around 5 to 10% of consumers are consistently being able to be sustainable consumers. And then the last problem is that sustainable consumption has issues with social class and purchasing power. Sustainable consumption is very much an elite project. They are often premium products, pricier, very much pricier than what your uh, poor consumers can afford. Therefore, they become kind of like fraught with tension when especially the poorer consumers are felt that they're being pushed down into something that they cannot afford or they do not like want to afford because they feel that this is sort of something that is thrown at them. So this is why ethical consumer goods or green goods are often in the niche categories up somewhere in the upper echelons of consumption. And they do not sort of pro like they do not trickle down to the rest of the product categories. So that is why it's proven false, but I think the more intriguing question is, why does it refuse to die and keep coming back? Because we've known about the attitude behavior gap since around, I don't know, 1980s, 1990s, but you still see these calls that consumers must you know, lead the change uh, for a greener future. So why does it this keep coming back, even though we in academia have known about the attitude behavior gap for decades? Well, I identify two reasons. The first reason is a little bit more cynical, and it's politics. There are, uh, admittedly, there are people who genuinely believe that consumers should lead the charge, and that's why they, for example, propagate this idea of ethical consumers. But there are also powerful industries who know that, for example, any mitigation of climate change might hurt their business interests, and that is why they are rather proposing alternative means to fighting climate change, and the ethical consumer just happens to be a very handy because it has a lot of public support and public belief that it actually works. And the oil industry has been sort of, the journalists have been doing a lot of important work uncovering that the oil industry or the fossil fuel industry is a very big part of this propagation of the ethical consumer theory, even though we know it's false. And it's not only uh, the, the popular press who says this, my colleagues at York University, Marcus Giesler and Ella Varisiu, they published a very important work in 2014 where they argued that this kind of thinking 
of um, the ethical consumer is systematically propagated by industry elites, especially at places like Davos, where they try to shift the conversation away from regulation, other types of cooperation, towards responsibilizing consumers, making sure that consumers are educated and consumers shop their values, which we know doesn't really work. But there's a deeper reason for this, I would, I would argue. It's about morality. Consumption is intertwined with questions of morality. What, what is good? What is a good life? And like, what kind of consumer goods allow you to live a good life? And yes, that is part of it. It kind of shows the, on the, in the, already in the ethical consumer idea that like, we should shop our values and we should show our morals to our consumption. But at a deeper level, there's also the, the flip side, that because we moralize consumption, we valorize production. And especially in places, well, in Finland, we're Lutherans. We love production. You have to be hard, you have to work every day, you have to do your job and blah, blah, blah. This is something that is everywhere. All societies, how, no matter how advanced they are, they have ethical systems that valorize production, see production as the source of creativity, renewal, and helping the village, helping society, whereas consumption is always seen as problematic, sinful, indulgent. We are almost hardwired to see consumption as the problem, but not production. And it's interesting because it's right there in our faces what the actual problem is. Production is what is creating the climate change problem to the point that there's 100 companies that are responsible for 71% of global emissions, yet we're talking more in the public press about how do we people become vegan rather than what do we do about these seven, like 71% companies. So my, my answer is what should we do instead? There's a lot of literature already that kind of has gone beyond this uh, attitude behavior gap, this ethical consumer myth. And my work uh, aligns it itself is there as well. So here is what I propose. So how do we move towards sustainable markets and actually create market transformation? Well, the first one, we need to understand how markets actually work and how they can be changed. Markets are not just simple dyads of here are your consumers and here are your marketers, and when consumers want something, the marketers will provide. No, market, markets are complex ecosystems of regulators, different types of infrastructures, laws, subsidies, and all of that. You need to understand where they should be changed and what is the, 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 sort of the limits of consumer power. Be an active citizen, not an active consumer. Like, we can't shop our way towards sustainability, but we can vote our ways towards sustainability. So lobby your congressman, write a letter, join a social movement, do whatever it takes to create the pressure towards regulatory changes rather than supermarket changes. Focus on production, not consumption. I've probably made that clear already. And lastly, when it comes to consumers, we should be focusing on understand how these future regulatory changes will impact, for example, the poorest of us and how we can provide them the easiest ways to adapt to kind of like not so that they do not suffer if we go uh, like adopt, for example, electric cars. We need to give these people who are like ill-advanced the means to thrive also in this carbon-free future. So, to kind of return back to the 2018 story, this is what I, I wrote back to these, a lot of these commentators and saying that emphasizing consumer choices in the flight, ag flight against climate change is a dangerous waste of time. And this made, uh, and I submitted this to the Helsinki Sanomat and it got me a lot of phone calls and a lot of interview requests. And this now I'm returning back to the academic stage in terms of a presentation. Thank you.